Morning and happy. Weinrich clan for being here today in force. Amen. I want to start a new thing for June with us. I hope that it will be something that you can enjoy because it has the word joy in it. How do we bring joy to God? Usually we're praying for him to bring joy to us. So the question we're going to try and answer in this month is how do we make God just jump for joy like he's so happy because of what we are or what we've done? So be thinking about that. That's sort of the overall plan. And so today um, I've entitled our time together Wits, Wits and Wisdom. And if you look at the front page, it describes or it is a painting of the scene that you have just heard about. Now, when I close my eyes and I, or if I look at that picture, I, I, I'm seeing an incredible moment in Israelite history. I'm seeing an incredible moment in, in prophetic history. I'm seeing the, the handing off from one prophet to another, and I, I'm, I'm seeing someone being taken to heaven visibly. And it's not Jesus. There's, there's, it's, it's such an incredible moment, and the way in which Elisha reacts is probably the way that we would all react. My, my, my God, why, why are you taking, taking Elijah away from me? But if you, had not, if you noticed in the first piece of what was read to you just a moment ago, you, you noticed that twice the uh, prophets of the school of the prophets say to Elisha, do you know that God is going to take your master away from you today? And what does he say to them? And I know, kids, this is a bad way to say it, but he tells them to shut up. Don't you mommies and daddies say, oh, you shouldn't say shut up. Please be quiet. Yeah, right. Here you have Elisha. Here you have Elisha knowing that for whatever reason, because we're not told, I looked. We're not told why he knew or how the prophets, how the other prophets knew, but they knew that Elijah was going to be taken away from Elisha. That's really the context of what we are looking at today. And I, I, I just want to now move back and ask, how many of you know the difference between wits and wisdom? It's, a, it's an older word. I know that we don't use the word wits very much, unless you are referring to your boyfriend and his witty comment sometimes in sarcastic tones, but uh, us guys, we don't get our feelings hurt too easily, right guys? Uh, but if you're told that you are witty, it means that you're smart, maybe in a literary sense. It means that you are interested in using big words for which I have been accused, and I know that my predecessor has been accused. Is that not right about Gregory? So, here I am using a very small word that doesn't get used very often, wits. Wits is that which we know. We have come to a knowledge of things and we, we know something. Okay? I would say that then the difference is between that and wisdom is what do you do with what you know? You're determined to be wise or foolish by what you do with what you know. And so we all, I believe, would like to be known as wise because we do good things with what we know. Uh, an example, uh, I, I know how to eat. Oh, yes. I know, I, and I, 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 but you see, I know not to eat, this is the wisdom piece, I know not to eat late at night if I want to avoid heartburn. 
Amen? All right, I've got some, some brothers and sisters out there with the same uh, piece of wisdom. Now, do I always act in a wise manner when it comes to this? No. Do I pay the price? Yes. So there are consequences actually to the, the non-practicing of wisdom. And as you get older, you realize the consequences may be something you just don't want, and so therefore you go with the, the wise idea. How about this? Uh, I know the joy of speed. Wisdom says that I should follow the speed limit uh, uh, to keep myself safe and to keep others safe. Um, I, I told the family last night as we were eating together that uh, yesterday on, on Soledad, I, I witnessed uh, a pretty scary accident. There's a couple that were following each other. Wife in the Civic, husband in the BMW. Okay. But the BMW was living up to my cousin's version of the name. It was a BMW. Because as he said to the policeman later, my car had lost power. Now this was the big BMW. And so to have a little Civic following a big BMW caught my attention as I went by. And my impulse, which I am now very sad that I did not follow, was to think I should have stopped and got in behind or I should have stopped and got in front and see if they needed a, you know, something, okay? So I went up to the commuter lot, turned around and was coming out of commuter way when I heard to my left a, a car crash. And I thought, oh no, she's been hit from behind. And sure enough, uh, somebody uh, of a younger age um, was coming up behind and was not paying as much attention and uh, smashed into the back of the Civic, catapulted the Civic out into traffic, which then hit the back end of another Civic, which drove him sideways, and he sheared off a telephone pole, which then fell down on top of him. He was the one, though, that was out of the car making the cell phone call to our men in uniform. No one was hurt really badly. There were several people who did stop and they took the young lady out of the initial vehicle and helped her and were giving her some first aid and some shock uh, relief. And then, you know, all the big trucks started to arrive and Soledad was blocked up and I went back to my car and I went shakily, I went back home and I thought to myself, you know, you don't expect you don't expect someone to throw their car at you from the side you're looking up front you're looking in your rearview mirror but you're just going about your business and suddenly wham you get hit from the side and your car that's doing 55 miles an hour down Soledad is now going sideways and headed towards the fence and the next thing you know is you're shearing off a telephone pole. You can have all kinds of wits. You can know how to drive. But you have to also have the trust that there are other people on the road that know how to drive. And so when that fails, you start checking on the wisdom of those fellow drivers on the road and were they making good choices? I can think of at least two or three things that she might have been doing that caused her to inadvertently take her eyes off of the road and then suddenly come up on the back of that Civic expecting it to be doing 55 when it was only doing five and to clip it in the back end and cause that lady to have a very bad day. I know what the sound of my alarm means. Do you know what the sound of your alarm means? Okay, that's wisdom. I know that. 
Uh, excuse me, that's wits. Uh, uh, wisdom. Don't hit the snooze button. Why? Because wisdom says stress will ensue. There's my big word for the day. Ensue. Stress will happen when you hit the snooze button not once but twice, and because you did, now you don't have the time that you needed to do what you needed to do before you left for work, and, and, and so you become stressed, and all because you didn't have the wisdom to listen to your preset when you were in your right mind before you went to bed. You preset that alarm knowing you didn't listen to it. Life teaches us, Brian reminded the kids this morning, school teaches us. For every one of us, I believe God teaches us. We learn and therefore we know stuff, right? I mean, one of the things that was on the list in the pastoral search was somebody who could, could preach, somebody who could teach so I suppose the assumption you had in your mind this morning when you decided to come to church was, we will, I suppose, eventually hear a sermon or hear Pastor Mike get up. And so it is my hope that you go away with something that will uh, stick with you. That's, that's our hope every week. But what we do, what we do with what we know determines whether or not we, we are wise. Um, how about a few examples of people who have used their wits? Um, I'm partial to Elon Musk. Some of you may think he's crazy. I think he is a little bit crazy, but then a lot of people have been a little bit crazy. Elon Musk owns a number of companies. One of them is SpaceX. Uh, I'm, I'm also partial to Elon because he's from South Africa, but that may or may not be a positive. I don't know. Um, Elon was told when he wanted to build a spaceship that there would need to be a specific kind of alloy used for multiple uses of the spaceship. And it didn't exist. So he went about inventing it so that his rockets could be on, on task in 2020 for the moon trips that he is planning to offer very, very wealthy people on earth. A chance to fly up to the moon, slingshot around, and come back down. It's on, it's on tap for, for 2020, but he had to invent the new alloy that his ships will be made of, or that certain joints in his ships will be made of. He has a lot of wits. Wisdom is often gained, though, by trial and error. I, I'm believing that this conference that we are part of, the Southern California Conference, as of my, past, my first pastor meeting on Tuesday, I am believing that the new administration of this conference is, is letting us do things, or is, is, is a permission-giving conference. It's, it's, it's wanting us to do things that will make a difference for the kingdom of heaven. And some of those things may be a little different than have happened before. I'm really happy to know that I'm part of a pastoral staff in a conference that is a permission-giving conference that allows us to go out and do stuff and make mistakes. One consultant that I was very glad to hear some time ago said, hurry up! Go out and make your first five mistakes. Get on with it. Wisdom, wisdom often comes in humanity by trial and error. And so being willing to make mistakes has made certain individuals very, very famous. One of them was Mr. Goodyear. You know the story. Akron, Ohio. Okay, He's boiling rubber. And he forgets it on the stove and it gets burnt. And the rubber tire is born from a mistake. Edison, same kind of guy. How many? Anyone know? How, electrical engineers, you should all know this. It was on the exam for your PhD. Um, <laughs> how many times did he try to make an incandescent light bulb that actually worked? Thousands. 
thousands of times until, until he got it right. Trial and error also brings wisdom. How about this? 40 years in the desert. 40 years in the desert. A, a tabernacle that is made from all the booty that you got from the Egyptians. That's what it was. God caused the Egyptians to be very generous with their Israelite slaves and he, Moses told the people to go to those Egyptian taskmasters and to ask for payment for all the years of slavery and they didn't ask questions. They gave them gold, silver, jewels. They gave them furs. And so when, he, when Moses comes down and he asks uh, for people to give so that they can build a tent one that could move because these were a people on the move, they brought and they brought and they brought until Moses had to say, stop, we've got enough. Amazing. I don't know if you've ever heard the end of an offering appeal in a church where that was said. Amen? Stop. <laughs> stop, you've, you've given enough. <laughs> But that's what, that's what Moses said, and that was what they were giving, was all of the stuff that the Egyptians had given to them. God made this tabernacle in the midst of them, put them in a, in a very, very organized fashion around it, and gave them a system of worship that taught them about himself. Sometime we'll have to go through that whole sanctuary thing simply because it to me it's so much fun because it's visual and it's tactile and 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 basically in in a nutshell i will tell you that it was god showing his people the way home the other end of the tabernacle of course is the is the ark and that's where god is and the shekinah glory is over that you want to come to me? Here's, here's how you come home. That's what he did. He, he, he put a whole system of teaching in the midst of his people and said, I want you to come and to be with me. I want to do that. I, I want to come and live with you until you can come and live with me. How's that? That's what the whole system was about, I believe. How about the fact that at one time, Elijah was tapped to go and remind Israel that this God was still in existence and that he had met with them at Mount Carmel. We don't hear, we don't hear much about Elijah before that. You realize that. He was from Tishbe. Anyone want to know that they're from Tishbe? I know in Arizona there's a place called Bisbee. It's kind of a crazy little town. But Elisha is known as one who is from Tishbe, and he comes on the scene for the sake of reminding the people about the God of Israel that they are not serving. But we're going to go forward from that now to the end. But I wanted to remind you of the beginning because if you know the beginning and you know the piece that Elijah was famous for, I want you to hold that in your mind because now we're coming to the end. Now we're coming to the end. We're in 2 Kings now and Ahab is dead. Ahab, the one that Elijah had just burst in on and told that his entire worship system was no longer going to work. And yes, if I had to unpack that for you, I would need to ask your permission so that you wouldn't decide that I was being rude. Baal was going to go down. And Elijah was there to let him know that that was happening. But now Ahab was dead. Ahaziah, his son, has uh, come to the throne. And the kingdom is separated. It was separated in the time of Ahab as well. And Jehoshaphat, don't you love that name? I know that there's some, there's some people with very interesting biblical names in the Weinrich family. Um, uh, but it's not Jehoshaphat. We, we have no Jehoshaphats here today, right? Uh, Jehoshaphat is, 
Fat, I, I don't know if that was a good ending to that name. Jehoshaphat is king of Judah. That's where we are. That's where we are. And, and the fact is, too, that Israel's vassal nation, okay, Israel's servant nation, if you like, is Moab. As you may or may not know, their previous relatives in the family Moab has to supply Israel with a thousand sheep. The king's table needs to be supplied with a thousand sheep a year, and they are rebelling. Ahaziah is on the throne. They figure Ahab is dead, Ahaziah is a dweeb, and we're not going to give him what he wants anymore. I don't know about you, but as I was rereading this whole situation uh, in preparation, I want you to know that, that there were scenes of the United States in my mind. I don't know if that's a leap, but maybe it is. Things, things were falling apart for the previously successful Israel. Mount Carmel has been forgotten. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And how were they? They were face down on the ground because the fire was licking up not only the sacrifice, but the stones and the water that Elijah had drenched the entire operation with. There's a crater. There's a smoking crater in the ground and they're face down on the ground saying, the Lord, he is God. And they didn't get in his way. They didn't get in Elijah's way when he went and killed the 400 prophets of Baal. We tend not to want to think of those moments, but that is what had happened. Now Ahaziah has followed in his father's footsteps. He is, he is sick on a bed, the Bible tells us at the end of 1 Kings. He's sick on a bed because he has fallen. He's had a, a bad fall and he wants to know, am I going to get better? There's numbers of us who have had injuries in, 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 and, and we are interested in knowing, is God going to heal me? We may have relatives who are sick. We may be praying for them. We are praying to God, I believe, the God of the universe, what does Ahaziah do? He sends his people to Ekron to pray to Baal Zebub. Trying to, trying to be as good at the pronunciation as I can. Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. You can know a lot, I believe. You can be the child of privilege. But what you do with what you know determines whether or not you are wise. Let's remember that there was a time in Elijah's life. This is part of the story that, that I don't know, when you were listening to it as a kid or when you read it as an adult, I don't know how this hit you. But we cannot forget the time that happened just after the fire fell. Elijah tells Ahab, there's a storm coming. I've seen the first cloud. You better get in your chariot and you better go home. I want you to know that, that as an athlete or as, as a person who has had athletic tendencies in the past, what happens next is pretty incredible. Elijah runs before the chariot of Ahab all the way from Carmel back to Samaria. Now, your, your afternoon entertainment should be to get your Bible out and uh, figure out how many kilometers or how many miles that was. But I'm going to tell you it was more than a marathon. He is possessed, I believe, at this moment. He is possessed by the Spirit of God, and he runs before the chariot because it is raining so hard. God has loosened the clouds. He's loosened the uh, ability for Baal worshippers now to claim that Baal has sent the rain. Everybody knows now that it is God that has sent the rain, and his prophet is running in front of, Eli, of Ahab. Elijah is running in front. 
He gets to Samaria, and he doesn't go in. It's curious. He doesn't go into the city. He stays outside. And what happens next is very strange because you would think that somebody who knows God and his power wouldn't do this. But a note comes through a messenger from Jezebel to Elijah and says, I am going to do the same thing that you did to my prophets. I am going to do to you by this time tomorrow. I'm going to hunt you down and I'm going to kill you. At that very moment, Elijah takes his servant. I don't know if he tells him, we got to go. He picks up his robes and he starts running again. Now he's just run more than a marathon, I believe, from Carmel to Samaria. He then runs from Samaria all the way down, the Bible says, to Beersheba. And at that point, he leaves his servant there. And he goes another day's journey. I don't know if he's running at this point, but the Bible says he goes another day's journey into the desert. And that, you know, for, for today's purposes, I don't want us to, to get caught up in what happens there, but that is where God finds him in a cave in the desert having run away from Jezebel. So lest we get all high and mighty about Ahaziah and how bad he was because he followed in the footsteps of his bad father Ahab and did the same kinds of things and when he was in trouble called upon Beelzebub, god of Ekron, instead of El, god of Israel, we should also look at Elijah. In this critical moment, in this critical moment, Elijah runs. He runs. But God comes and has a little chat with him. They find him in, in the cave. And I want you to know that we serve a very compassionate, very loving God. And I don't know about you, but I've been in that cave. And that still small voice has come and has said the same thing to me, and I hope it said the same thing to you. What on earth are you doing here? You know, you have the wits. You have the wits. You know who I am. I just sent fire down from heaven. What are you doing here? One lady caused you to run this far? Are you kidding me? In verse 17, God very quietly sends him on a mission. And it's amazing. I don't know at what age this is in Elijah's life, but he sends him on a mission to find his replacement. Now, I don't know how you feel if your boss comes to you and says, um, it's time to find your replacement. How does that make you feel? E Elijah says back, you know, I, I'm, I'm the only one. Um, you know, you can't really do without me. But God, again, very quietly reminds him. He uses, I believe, a symbolic number because it's got a seven in it. He says, no, no, sorry, Elijah. You thought you were the only one, but there are yet 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And I like the next bit, which tells you a little bit about the religion, nor kissed him. You're not alone, my brother. There may be a rebellious, godless king, but you 
are a fearful prophet? Are you full of wits? Or are you full of wisdom? Both knew that there was a God who could do stuff. Both had relied in their life upon their own wits, their own knowledge or their own ideas about what the situation held for them. One had gone to the God of Ekron. The other had just relied upon his legs to get him away from Jezebel. So, as we think about this, what, what do we think either of these guys does in order to bring joy to God? The king, for looking elsewhere for his help when he's sick in bed, or Elijah when he's in the cave running away from Jezebel. If you go back to 1 Kings, right there at the beginning, there are men sent to get Elijah. Going to see another situation in which wits and wisdom get used. The first captain is the captain of 50 men. He comes to Elijah Elijah and says, uh, uh, the king has said you must come with us and go and see him. And Elijah says something interesting. It, It begins with an if. Sometimes the smallest words make the biggest difference. He is under, trying to understand in his life whether or not he is still the prophet that brought down fire from God. And he says, if I am the prophet of the living God, then he is going to send fire down right now and burn you guys up. And boom, fire falls. Ooh, I guess I still got it. So he stays on that rock and another guy comes with another 50 men and he too is brusque. He too is going on his wits. He too is thinking, I'm the, I'm the man and I've got all these people with me and, and we can take this guy. And he commands him to come down and Elijah, Elijah says the same thing to him. If, if I am the prophet of the living God, he is going to send fire down upon you and he's going to burn you up. And the same thing happens. And so now there's what? 102 guys dead. Ahaziah doesn't give up. He sends another group into the fray. And and this guy, this guy shows true wisdom. He comes on bended knee to Elijah and says, please, I've got a job to do, but I respect you. Would you come with me? And the Bible says that the, the angel of the Lord told Elijah, it's okay, you can go with him. And it wasn't until that release had come from the angel of the Lord that Elijah decided this was what God wanted him to do. The fact that those other two groups had been burnt up wasn't even enough for Elijah. He needed to hear that still small voice. He had learned the difference between wits and wisdom. The last part, and this comes to the the picture on the front. We're back to the beginning again. Elisha and Elijah. It's the end. Elijah knows it's the end. Elisha knows it's the end. The 50 prophets behind them know it's the end. I love this. It, it, it makes me laugh in some respects to see what Elisha would do. He tells them to be quiet. But Elijah's kind of trying to jettison him, isn't he? I'm going on, you stay here. I'm going on, you stay here. No, as the Lord lives as you live, I will not leave you. So now they get to the part which I think is interesting because we have been talking a lot about stories where the Israelites pass through on dry ground. 
Here you have Elijah much later on in the kings of Israel and he rolls up his cloak and he flicks the waters in the name of God and the waters of the Jordan part and he and Elisha go across on dry land. Are you noticing a trend here about the power of God and the way in which he wants to demonstrate that that it is he who is doing it? He is the creator God. If I, you know, I, I always love to remind people of that. I did this this week. He is, the, he is the God who made us. He is the God who can part the waters for you in your life. Elisha goes across, and because he is with Elijah in that moment when the chariot of fire comes down and comes right between them and takes Elijah... And leaves him behind. And as Elijah is going up, he drops the mantle. We call it the mantle. We still use that when we think of passing on one piece of, of, of identity to another person. We, we put on a mantle. We, put, we, we use that word metaphorically like that. A little patch of earth. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, they had a caping. Each of the children got to make their own superhero cape. Isn't that great? Maybe we should do that in church sometime. I don't know who you would choose, but, uh, and I don't know who I would choose exactly, but yeah, they did, they, that was their little graduation. You are now going to move on. We're going to recognize you. You're going to kindergarten. Elijah drops the cape. He drops the cloak the mantle. And Elisha picks it up. Elijah's gone now in a whirlwind, the Bible says in a whirlwind, up into heaven. And the next time we see him is at the side of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we know he got there. We know he got to heaven. And he was with Moses. And he visited Jesus a little bit later on, see? So that's the next time we see him. So he's alive and he's in heaven. So don't get all upset with those friends of yours who say that when you die, you go to heaven. Because some people do. He winds that cloak up and he asks a question. Where is the God of Elijah? And I'd like that to be your question today too. Because you see, spiritually speaking, God has empowered all those who call upon his name to be his prophets, to be his ministers, to be his hands and feet in the world. The question is, do you know enough? Some of you are going to say, oh, I don't know enough. I I don't know God enough. Well, good news, the church is here hoping to help you. You just have to appropriate what the church has to offer or whatever spiritual guru person you are listening to, hopefully they also believe in the God of creation. So we can all, in some respects today, metaphorically speaking, we can all wind up the mantle that has been passed to us through our spiritual ancestors, and we can strike the water, and we can say, where is the God of creation? Where is the God of Elijah? The God who sent fire to prove himself, to prove that he is the one who is the God of all the elements, if you like. Fire, water, wind, air earth. We can ask the same question as Elisha did that day, and for him the waters also parted, and he walked through on dry land. The signature of the Creator and his presence in Elisha's life, and a telling to Elisha that this was not going to be just because you knew Elijah. No, this is now going to be because you know me, and because you know me, I'm going to use you to be my prophet. I'm going to use you to talk to people, to be with people, and to do my, my work for me in amongst the people. I'm going to be with you. 
And I'm going to say to you today that we can leave this place today knowing that God would like us all to participate in that kind of ministry. We, we represent hundreds of spheres of influence and he is asking us to take up that mantle and to flick the waters and say, where is the God of creation? Is he going to be part of my life? Is he going to walk and talk with me this week? And I believe that we can all come back next week and if we wanted to, we could have a testimony session and we could say, okay, so how did God part, part the waters for you this week? So it's going to take not only your wits, it's not, it's not only going to take your wits to make God happy and to make him joyful, it's going to take the fact that you accepted his wisdom in, in your life and that you trusted him like Elisha trusted him. So I, I, I bid you uh, go forth. Go forth this week and try God out. If you've got exams, if you've got uh, projects at work, I don't know what it is, what it's going to be for you. Uh, maybe, maybe you want to know whether or not the boyfriend is the right one. You know, or I don't know. Call upon the God of creation. Ask him to part the waters. Ask him to let you move forward into the ministry that he has called you to this week. And then next week, we'll get together and praise him for what he did in your life. Deal? Good. None of you said no deal. So that's fine. I'm going to hold you to it. Amen.